All right, folks, welcome back to Talking Soccer. I am, of course, Justin Horniker, fresh off of St. Louis City's pre-game press conference for Wednesday. This is the time of year that it gets a little bit exhausting to keep up with the soccer calendar, but we're here. It's going to be a long week. Uh, just a little bit of a heads up. Expect some videos from the road this week as I am here in St. Louis for today and then for Wednesday's match against FC Dallas. Then at the press conference on Thursday, I'll then be going to Kansas City to watch the KC Current play Angel City on Friday night. And then, of course, St. Louis and Kansas City from Children's Mercy Park on Saturday for the Derby that has yet to be named. But for now, that is not what we are talking about. Again, if this is your first time finding the channel, thank you so much. We have a lot planned for the upcoming months as I get my shit together. But for now, if you could be so kind and subscribe, hit that like button. And let's talk about St. Louis City losing 2-1 to one to Orlando City this past weekend. And it was a... I wrote in my article for your Sports Network, this was a heartbreaking loss. And in a way, yes, obviously when you come so close to clawing back a draw, only for it to be taken away on a pretty harsh penalty call in stoppage time. And that's going to lead for, for some hard feelings in the moment. But looking back on it, you know, outside of that penalty, it was a pretty 50-50 match. Uh, that penalty, of course, being the difference maker like it should. But in a way, you could say, all right, modern interpretation of the handball rules. What even is a handball at this point? But on the other hand, St. Louis kind of deserved to feel something for how porous they were in, in the defensive half for the final 10 minutes of that match. So... You can't necessarily be too mad. There was a reason that that call had to be made, is that Orlando City had a scoring opportunity. Mark Kinnish makes a play on the ball. He you know, hits it with his face in his hand. And you know, you could say that that's harsh, but Mark Kinnish was diving for the ball. So in a way, you're making a play on the ball. Something's going to happen there, and it could go one way or the other. Unfortunately for St. Louis City, it goes against them. But you play that game a hundred times, you know, 45 of those, I guess, go in your favor, right? That's how statistics work. But I think it shows, too, the heightened expectations around a team like St. Louis City, where you are, you know, this expansion side that didn't necessarily have high expectations going into the season. I mean, people, you talk about it at length, right? Everyone, including myself, were cautious about this roster build and we're essentially looking for a team to be respectful respectable play respectable soccer and you know maybe fight for a playoff spot in the end but instead you have a team that despite their loss on saturday is still four points clear of lafc of the seattle sounders of fc dallas of real salt lake four points you know plus some i think there's a five point difference between third and eighth or third and tenth place uh, and then City has a five-point lead or four-point lead of LAFC and so on and so forth. It's a commanding lead. It's over one game with nine games remaining. Now, LAFC, I think, is still a much more talented team at the very least. And if they were in a complete season that they didn't have breaks for you know, their League Cup participation, their Champions League participation, all the competitions that they are in, including you know, going all the way in the MLS playoffs last year, you could maybe argue that LAFC are the better team in this conference. They're the team that deserve to be in the top of the West. But that's not how tables are determined. you got to play the games, baby. And St. Louis being first place with nine matches remaining, they're going to be clinching a playoff spot here pretty soon. And, you know, you could say this fan base is becoming spoiled, obviously. You would expect that this won't be happening every year but they're building something tangible that you can look forward to, that you can be excited about. And that talks to some of the disappointment being felt after Saturday's loss in Orlando. Now, to water under the bridge, they host FC Dallas at home. They lost bitterly 3-0 in Dallas earlier this year. That was the game that was postponed because of the weather. So they played two separate halves and two separate months. And it's hard to really get a read on, you know, what that match truly was, but here, in the return match, the St. Louis won a bounce back, especially since they're heading to Kansas this weekend. KC have been hotter, especially at home, than they've been the rest of the year, especially over the second half. They've kind of caught up 
to how they should be playing. So that's not going to be an easy match. And obviously the emotion of the moment, uh, Indiana Vasilev said when Kansas City were in St. Louis a couple months ago that you know they know that it means a lot to the fans and you internalize that. The players internalize that meaning. And they, I think Indy's exact quote where the fans don't like him, we don't like him. And you just know that, you know, the intensity and the, the quick turnaround. So that leads us to today's press conference. We got some clarification on Nicholas Giochini. Giochini suffered a shoulder injury during training last week, aggravated it in a rough tackle in Orlando in, I think, like the 25th minute, struggled to play the rest of the half, and then is subbed off at halftime. Bradley Carnell said they had an MRI. The MRI looked good had a good conversation with the doctor in that a turnaround for Wednesday may be a little bit too close, especially with the soreness and, you know, they can rotate in a way. And, but he is definitely going to be ready for Saturday, but they're playing a little close to the vest. Of course, we also got to speak with Zhao Klaus, who had a lot to say about his injury process that, you know, originally he felt kind of a burning as he was running, I think in the Colorado match that he initially comes out of. And the MRI looked good. They gave it 15 days. He was feeling better. He was pushing his level. But every time he would take those two weeks off, he would increase the intensity. Something just wasn't feeling right. And it turns out that it wasn't just the muscle, that he had tendon damage as well. That was the kind of main litigating factor in what took so long. So finally, they decided to shut it down, let the tendon heal. But in the back of his mind, he's thinking, OK, I felt good before. And now you're a little bit apprehensive to push yourself as hard as you maybe were before. But he also said that once he got into the pitch last week, you know, he had seven touches in his nine minute appearance. So not a huge, not a huge appearance, but the victory of getting back onto the pitch, I think was the focus of that match. So Bradley Carnell said he was unsure if Klaus would be ready for you know, three matches in a week. Fair, but just to see that progress of coming back for seven minutes, maybe he comes back for you know, 30 and Wednesday and maybe he's ready to play a full half or so Saturday in Kansas City. But I thought it was interesting because Klaus talked about he had never been injured before since he started playing the game at 10 years old. And when you're going through this for the first time, it's now maybe a little more understandable of how you know, frustrating it really was to a guy who was so competitive, he was so used to his body performing at the level that he needs it to perform at. And then now it just, not cooperating and you're second guessing yourself. And I think there's a lot of you know, mental health questions around that. And, you know, hearing the guy talk about it, seeing him happy, seeing him back on the pitch, I think is all the good news for the day. So I guess that's kind of where we head off this video. Let me know what you thought of St. Louis's performance against Orlando down in the comments below. I guess a couple other notes about it. I think that match was more about Oscar Perea and his team than St. Louis and Bradley Carnell. I think there are obviously questions with Bradley Carnell's 4-4-2 you know, diamond that you know, it seems like on the road especially they've had difficulties in that formation. Then there's also the fact that Xabu Lublam wasn't available for that match. They have only dropped points in three matches that Xabu Lublam has been the starter for and they dropped points in ten matches without Xabu Lublam. So, he is such an important factor, not just in that he is, you know, a brick wall at the six that he's called the stopper for a reason, but with Jabu Lublam out, there aren't a lot of players in this roster that can play the six. That's why Miggy Perez was able to kind of carve out a niche for himself earlier in the season. So now in this match, you have to play Akil Watts as a holding midfielder, and Akil Watts can play that position. but then you're kind of sacrificing Watts and how effective he's been on the right, how effective he's been out wide and pushing the pace and progressing the ball. You're taking that away for Jake Nerwinski, who gets a red in this match. He'll be unavailable for the next two matches, but frankly was not very effective in this match. Kyle Hebert is a center back playing left back, and he... Kyle Hebert is very good at being a defensive player, and he's very good at getting the ball up the pitch every once in a while, but he is not a left back, and he's not in the mold of think how Bradley Carnell wants to use his fullback. So that's where you see Markinich come in, make the impact that he made. He comes on and seven minutes later, he has the assist to Alm that draw the game level. You can kind of see why City looked to Markinich 
what they saw from him at Colorado and thought, okay, we can make this work here, especially when we don't necessarily have the resources to go out and, you know, buy a DP fullback or, you know, a fullback from somewhere else that at this point in the season is going to be successful for you. So that's something I thought of after this match, just kind of looking into the future, looking into next winter in the, in the winter transfer window, that I think a big place where City can get better is either at left back or right back. And some of that is you have players in the academy that they are waiting on to come up. Understandable that they want to leave those pathways open for players to come forward. I think Caden Glover is kind of feeling the adverse effects of that and that, you know, City are not wanting for strikers. Caden Glover scored a brace for City 2 on Sunday, but Bradley Carnell said he doesn't really see him in the rotation just because they have Tomas Ostrak, they have Nook Vitoris, and they can play that position now as well. So even if Klaus and Jokini are you know, out for Wednesday or, you know, not able to start on Wednesday. They're still Thorsen, they're still Stan Adeneran, it will go. And Adeneran, I think, playing at home will want kind of a bounce back match too, because this is where Oscar Perea was so successful is that they isolated Sam Adeneran kind of on the left side. They weren't so that he wasn't able to kind of link back up with the play when he had the ball. So he was a little bit isolated. And where you saw last week when he came in off the bench, he was able to make some individual plays that was you know off of his runs off of being able to link up with the midfield and that wasn't available in orlando so you're learning some things about this team really some things about how they can bounce forward but ultimately at the end of the day it's hard to win on the road you lost to a very good orlando city team by a stoppage time goal that could have went either way so how mad can you really be anyway we'll end it there so thank you all so much for watching today's video let me know what you thought of this match in the comments what you thought think of kind of the mls Outlook overall, I'll have a bigger video just kind of looking at the storylines of this week as we are you know, getting dangerously close to the playoffs, just about a month and a half away to the, the time that really matters in the MLS schedule. But hope you all have a great day. We'll talk very soon.